Well, good morning. For those of you don't, who don't know me, I'm Kath Norman, the Managing Director of FAR. And uh, it's been another really busy year for FAR, the 2018 calendar year. As, as you've all seen, we drilled our first uh, operated well offshore the Gambia, and I'd like to talk to you a lot about that in this presentation. But also we're maturing our company in terms of getting much closer to uh, the development of our big uh, SNE oil field offshore Senegal. But before we get into the presentation, I'd like to introduce you to the leadership team at FAR. And if the people can just stand up or wave so that everyone knows who you are, that would be great. So first off the mark is Pete Tyson, our company secretary. Uh, Pete Nichols, our exploration manager. John Keel, our chief geoscientist. Uh, Michael Cowie, our in-house counsel. Uh, Rolf Stork, our asset manager for the Gambia. Angelique Caligari, who's our investor relations. Um, coordinator and Chris Carra. I don't know if Chris is. Oh, Chris is here. Chris uh, is actually uh, our facilities engineer or chief engineer responsible for the Senegal project, and he comes to us courtesy of our uh, joint venture arrangement with AMOG Consulting, a group of engineers here in Melbourne who we've been dealing with, with for many years now. Um, so please take the time to m make yourself acquainted with some of these people if you have any questions afterwards. I'm sure they'll be happy to have a cup of tea and a chat with you. So some highlights from last year. It was a big year for us and um, every year really since we've drilled our discovery wells in 2014 in Senegal has been quite a big year. But last year felt like it was a year of two halves with the first year, first half of the year really being heavily focused on Gambia, the farm out we did to Petronas and then drilling the well in the latter half of the year. And then the second half of the year, much more focused on, well, delivering that well, but we went into feed in our project in Senegal and things really started to move in, st in terms of moving forward the development. We had just under $30 million in the bank at the end of the year. And as you saw a few weeks ago, we raised another $45 million um, that gives us a very healthy cash balance today of around $60, $65 million in, in that vicinity. Uh, which will allow us to get on with business and I'll talk to you a lot about what that business looks like for the next 12 months. It's been a challenging market this year. I don't think we can ignore that. I think I'll, um, I wanted to put this slide up as slide number one so we can get it out of the way and talk about some of the interesting things. But this is a slide that shows the Brent oil price from middle of 2000, well May 2013 to May 2019 in the blue versus the far market cap in the same time range. And you don't even need to be able to read the bars on the side to see that, that the big event for FAR was drilling our discovery wells back in the, at the end of 2014, which is the first peak you can see. And um, it's really difficult not to notice the oil price falling from $100 to nearly $30 back at the same time. So I've already always said this has been the perfect storm, but not in a good way for FAR. We seem to drill our terrific exploration wells right when the oil price is tumbling off a cliff. And it's, it's produced some challenging environments for us in the market over the last few years. But you can see that we've had some good um, market cap accretion over the last few years, mostly related to bringing forward all of the appraisal drilling in Senegal and bringing some good news about the, both the size of the Senegal field as it's been growing through our appraisal, but also adding to our portfolio, particularly in Gambia. And you can see that on the very right hand side of that graph, um, you can see where we failed to find oil in our summer well. And again, that, co that coincided with an oil price drop at the end of last year. So we got a bit of a double whammy when we uh, drilled that well last year, which was really unfortunate. However, we've got a wonderful field in Senegal and FAR's barrels that we have in that field can't be taken away and our, our core value is represented by those barrel, barrels in Senegal. And I would even argue that as we stand today, we're quite undervalued considering the amount of barrels of oil we've got in the ground. And we'll talk a bit about that as the presentation goes on. So 2019 will be the first year that FAR hasn't been involved in drilling a well for the last six years. So it's, um, it's a year of consolidation for us. It's mostly a year of bringing the Senegal project to fruition 
and then building on the good news and the drilling programs that we've got planned from 2020 onwards in both the Gambia and Guinea-Bissau. And so lots of good catalysts coming up towards the second half of this year and also early in 2020. So let's start with Senegal. It's an area in Senegal that we call the Rafisk Sangamar and Sangamar offshore blocks. Uh, we we um, abbreviate that to the RSSD blocks and we have 15% of the discovery, the SNE discovery and the surrounding acreage in Senegal. You can see here off West Africa our acreage position shown in the orange with the northern part being Senegal, blocks A2 and A5 are in the Gambia and then the southern blocks that we have in Guinea-Bissau. This area has become one of the hot areas of the world. I was in London last week presenting at an African summit for the industry. You name it, everybody was there. And we're getting surrounded now by big oil companies. I know I've talked about this before, but since we met last year at the AGM, we've seen BP take on some acreage in the Gambia. We've seen Petronas join Total drilling offshore Senegal. And in fact, they're drilling at the moment. Their well should be announced um, towards the end of June. It's a well being drilled. I hope we can get the. Sometimes the pointer doesn't work on the screen, but it's a well being drilled out to the west of our acreage in, uh, that we hold in Senegal, drilling a completely different play to the geological play types that we're drilling. So it'll be really interesting to see what Total and Petronas can find there. And of course, over the year, we also saw Exxon pick up large tracts of acreage in the ultra deep water offshore Mauritania. So we've got a lot of new neighbours uh, joining us. Um, it's starting to get a bit crowded around there. We're seeing ENI and CNUC get more active in this part of the world, opening offices in Dakar and picking up some blocks in and around us as well. So as far as Senegal goes for far though, we've had a really fantastic run. We've drilled 11 wells offshore Senegal in the last five years. We've made four independent discoveries in those 11 wells and we've drilled seven appraisal wells to finally get us to the point where we could declare commerciality on the SNE field mid last year. The four independent discoveries at SNE, the big one that we are bringing to development, the deep water fan discovery, a well called Fan South that we drilled in 2017, and SNE North. And our joint venture has submitted two things, two important documents. We've submitted a, a development and exploration plan for approval by the government for the development of the SNE field. And we've also submitted an application to evaluate those other discoveries in and around SNE. Our joint ventures invested about a billion dollars to date exploring offshore Senegal. This has been um, over the last five years. It's a significant investment that we have in Senegal and we must be one of the biggest investors in the country to date as a joint venture. Closely followed now by BP and I guess Nick's um, old mining company who had a large mineral sands project along the coast. So the group that you see in the room here are responsible for an awful lot of investment in the country of Senegal and it's not gone unnoticed and we have a very good reputation and great relationships with the government there. So on to our field. This might sound a bit incredulous, but we've got five billion barrels of oil in place in the Senegal complex. It's a huge uh, oil deposit covering about 350 square kilometres in footprint. The development that we are um, planning with the joint venture is planning to develop just over 500 million barrels of that oil and in phase one about 230 odd million barrels of the oil and we'll see first oil from that phase one in 2022. When you hear those numbers and you hear 500 million barrels from 5 billion, it tells you 10% recovery from that, that field. That sounds low. We would agree. And we think there's enormous up, upside potential in this field that we won't be recognizing immediately. But in time, when we get some producing wells out of the field, we know that we're gonna produce a lot more than that half a billion barrels possibly two or three times that over the life of the field. So a really important project for FAR and our shareholders going forward. We'll be seeing first oil in 2022 and, um, and first cash flow coming from 2023. So let's zoom in a little bit here and talk about what we've been up to in the last 12 months in Senegal. So 
We have, as I said, applied for a, an exploitation license, and that is the box you can see in red around the SNE field um, that's marked here. Green being the oil leg, and red being the gas cap sitting on top of the field. And then in the bright blue area that you can see surrounding our discoveries, you can see the, um, or maybe it's not on this one, I hope it is. It seems very, um, oh, actually it's on my next slide. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. The bright blue area, you can see the area we're calling the evaluation area that we've applied for to evaluate the other three discoveries. We can tie back discoveries into the SE development if they're within a radius of about 35 to 40 kilometres. So the discoveries we've made to date outside SNE are within tieback range. And the joint venture's aim has always been to get the hub development at SNE off the ground and start the development of the phase one barrels that are in the core of the SNE field. And then in phase two, tie in some of those barrels that sit on the extremities of the field. And then phase three, tie in those other discoveries once we've evaluated them um, uh, around, in and around the SNE field. So plenty of work to do in Senegal over the next couple of years. I'm going to jump back to the previous slide because I do want to talk about the achievements that the joint ventures um, um, had over the last 12 months. We commenced FEED, the front end engineering and design for the development back in November, December last year. And we have awarded the FPSO building contract or the FPSO mm -hmm. FEED contract to MODEC, the FPSO supplier. We've avoided, awarded the subsea to subsea integration alliance SIA, who've been working with us for six months on that now. And we've only recently, as you may have read, um, awarded the tender for the drilling and completion for the development drilling uh, to Diamond Offshore. And final contracts will be signed once the development plan is approved by the government. We also got the environmentals approve, um, environmental uh, approval through uh, early this year for the development. And there's an awful lot of work going on now to make sure that the paperwork's been put in place and we're starting the compliance with the environmental regulations. So from a preparatory point of view, everything is going rather smoothly. We're a couple of months behind, but I think that that's probably expected when you're dealing with a country that's never had a deep water development before. So it's all within the normal error bars of what we would expect from a scheduling point of view. So what are we planning to do this year in Senegal? Well, the big one is that we're planning to reach our final investment decision and start the execute or the building phase. And we're hoping to get to FID in the latter half of this year, probably towards the end of the year. Uh, we are, the government had a number of queries about the development plan that we submitted. So the plan is to resubmit that around mid-year this year. Uh, we will be acquiring some new 3D seismic data that will allow us to uh, better locate our wells and understand the field before we embark on development and that 3D seismic survey will likely be ex extended over some of the discoveries in the evaluation area as well. So a bit of new data being acquired before we embark on the development. And most importantly I guess is the financing for the development and that's something that we at FAR have been working on for a couple of years now with the joint venture and Tim Woodall who's on our board has been brought on in a special director role to help advise on the financing. It's uh, corporate finance and finance is his specialist background area. So it's been terrific to have Tim on board working with us for nearly 18 months now on the financing. It's a long process, believe me. The phase one capex for the development is about $3 billion. So FAR's share, I'm talking US dollars, is just over $400 million. And that's assuming that the government increase their stake to 18%, which is highly likely from 10. They have a right to do that. So we go down pro rata to about 13.7% in the joint venture working interest. About 50% of that $3 billion in capex is likely to be financed through a joint venture project financing exercise uh, through export credit agencies and banks. And Tim's been at the front leading FAR's participation in that process. And then we have been uh, slowly fine-tuning our options for funding the other 50% share of FAR's CAPEX requirements for Phase 1. And you may have seen recently that um, we are joining CAN in a process to consider selling uh, 
um, part of our holding in the SNE to see if we can fund some of the capex. That's one of the options we have. We may or may not do that. It just it's going to depend on price, of course, at the time. Uh, we're looking at other forms of debt, and we're looking at the bond market as well. So we're not really in a position yet because we haven't finished off um, their final costs and uh, plan for the development with the joint venture. So. Most of the financiers to the development are, of course, going to want to do due diligence on what the development looks like before they commit to their monies to the project. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg at the moment. We're lining up all of the parties and we're waiting for the final development plan to be um, signed off by the joint venture before we can finalise the project finance. And of course, after the final investment decision will be an execute phase. An execute phase will be uh, nearly three years. We should have first oil by the end of 2022 and we'll be starting the development drilling at the end of 2020, early 2021. So lots going on in the joint venture at the moment as you can imagine to coordinate all of these activities at the same time. Hundreds of contracts being signed amongst the joint venture party, parties at the moment and we're keeping Michael Cowie, our in-house counsel, very busy. So what does the development look like? Well, it's going to be a floating production and storage offtake vessel, an FPSO, uh, which will sit about um, 80 kilometres offshore from Dakar. And then we will have subsea tiebacks. There are about 23 wells being drilled as part of the development, including the water and gas injectors. So out of that is about uh, 12 producers and the rest are uh, water and gas injectors. <coughs> We've got a terrific field. Um, we've got about a 100 metre oil column. We've got about 36 odd metres of net pay. But this is a beautiful oil field. Our average porosity of our rocks is about 24%. And our average hydrocarbon saturation is really high. I mean, these are beautiful source rocks and beautiful reservoirs. Phase one development should be um, producing about 100,000 barrels a day from 2022. But in actual fact, the capex that we're undertaking in phase one is a little more than we need for the phase one production. And the reason for that is because we want to right size the FPSO primarily and right size the subsea architecture so that we can tie back additional barrels in the future. And our aim is to get up to 150,000 barrels peak production once we get into phase two. So uh, capex seems high but we're actually spending money today to save money further down the track in the development. I'm not going to say too much more about Senegal. I think we're all on top of what's going on there. I'm certainly happy to have some more discussions about it. But it is a fantastic project. It's really under the spotlight at the moment. It's attracting a lot of attention from international companies who are in the data room and we look forward to bringing you some more news in the coming months of A, resubmitting the development plan, B, getting the economics out in the public domain because we haven't finished those yet either and agreed them amongst the joint venture, and then C, being able to talk to you about the financing plan for the development. The Gambia was a really big project for us last year. Uh, we started the year by bringing Petronas in as our partners into the joint venture. So we had 40% each of the, of the joint venture. Petronas, of course, carried us through the drilling of the exploration well and also paid us a large chunk of cash uh, to cover back costs that FAR had incurred in the Gambia. And all in all, to the end of 2018, we'd spent a million US dollars in the Gambia and had a huge swing at an enormous prospect. And I think I'm really proud of our organisation for delivering that well under budget, efficiently, safely, and also under the spotlight and, and under the sharp eye of our big international partner. So our team has to be really credited for that. In a bit of a change in the way we present uh, at the AGM, I would like to introduce Rolf Stork to talk about the Gambia. He's our asset manager. He joined us last year to primarily um, deal with all issues in the Gambia, but uh, tasked uh, uh, most importantly with delivering us the well safely. And Rolf has spent a lot of time in the Gambia now, formed good relationships, um, rolled out the FAR strategy and the FAR culture into our Gambian office 
and he's earned immense respect from the government in the Gambia. And so I'll hand over the reins for Rolf to talk to you a little bit about the Gambia and, and what it means for FAR. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kat, for those, uh, those words. Uh, yes, um, uh, so I'm very delighted to be here and indeed to work in the Gambia, which is quite exciting country to be in when you're an explorer for oil and gas. Um, and of course, uh, as Kath mentioned, my name is Rolf Stork and I'm the asset manager for the Gambia, which means I run the business of the Gambia for far. And I'll, hopefully I can do the slides. Uh, here we are. Okay. So yes, as Kath mentioned, um, the last uh, 18 months has been a, a, a big time for far in the Gambia and a lot of achievement. And we're very proud of all these things. I guess the first big one was the farming of Petronas. Petronas farmed in uh, to earn a 40% share and with that they carried they carried far on, on the first well, which meant that they, they paid our expenses on that well. And, um, and we are very pleased to have Petronas as a partner. Uh, I myself know Petronas quite well, having worked uh, in Malaysia in, in previously. And um, we have a very, very constructive and productive working relationship with them and find them very, very good to work with. And indeed, from their side, they're very pleased with FAR as an operator at this stage of the, uh, the business of the Gambia. They're very supportive. So we were very uh, pleased to have drilled these uh, summer well last year. This was a big undertaking for a company like FAR, and FAR scaled up and uh, was able to uh, drill this well, but not only drill it, but they drill it very success successfully, efficiently, <laughs> safely, and within budget, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But I guess the important thing was we drilled it as an operator, and that's a big thing for a small company like FAR to do, as operator, to drill that well. As, as Kath mentioned earlier, yeah, the well was not successful, it didn't find oil. However, um, we did uh, we did collect a lot of uh, information from that well. I guess the well was the first well drilled in Gambia in 40 years. And we use, of course, modern technology and tools. And we gathered a lot of information from that. Um, in fact, uh, even though the well was not successful, we did not cut back and we continued with a very extensive logging, sampling and data acquisition program. And then that data is brought back into the subsurface team and they go forward with that. Uh, reviewing all the data and then evaluating future prospects. And um, I can say that having looked at that, uh, we're still um, very motivated about the petroleum system in Gambia and very keen to get on with further exploration uh, in, 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 in the country. Um, so the licenses uh, we have are A2 and A5 and uh, the next license period starts on 1st of July for another two years and uh, with a work commitment to drill one well in either of those, those two blocks. So just a little bit more about the well, because we are very proud about this well and drilling it as an operator. So we drilled this well to 3,200 metres from, from, um, from the drill rig down. And that was within uh, the first 1,000 metres was in 1,000 metres of water before even getting to the seabed and then drilling into, into the rock. So it's what they call the deep water. It's a, it's a very high-end um, uh, well uh, drilled in deep water, deep water um, Drilling and it was drilled with the uh, Stena Drillmax uh, rig, and uh, we, as, as as we mentioned, it was drilled uh, within budget. In fact, it was drilled at the top end of our, uh, our our budgetary range, at our best, almost our best case of our meeting our budget. Uh, very pleased about that, as well as achieving all our safety and environmental objectives. Literally, everything was achieved right on budget, uh, ahead of budget, and uh, and very very well and very efficiently. And and this, of course, was not done. It was done with the with the with the team and the contractors that we and I'd like to pay tribute to that, to the group that helped us uh, drill that well. In particular, Stena, the Stena that provided the the drill rig, showing the picture there, the drill rig and the crews that ran that very, a very very good rig drill ship, and crew did a, did a very good job. This was supported by um, Exceed, the company Exceed. Uh, based in Aberdeen, that's our drilling management and engineering company. They did a very good job, and then of course our internal FAR team, that with all their hard work, uh, that all came, uh, all, all led to the success of this work, this well. Um, so we're very pleased with this because it demonstrated uh, FAR as an operator, as we're able to drill in deep water Africa, and that's um, that's a very good thing. And also we also demonstrated how we deliver work programs uh, and obligations under the license, which is not always achieved. And uh, so with those two things, as operator and able to deliver work programs, it really is uh, uh, highly valued in the region and it builds very good for our reputation. A couple of pictures of the drilling there, um, just to explain a few there. The middle picture there is the, um, 
the uh, the first uh, the jetting jetting and drilling tool that first touched the seabed. So that picture there was taken in a thousand meters of water, and you can just see the seabed as a drill drill bit assembly just touches bottom first time in 40 years. A uh, thousand meters of water, you know, offshore Gambia, and that picture was taken separately with an ROV ROV um, uh, uh, device that uh, goes down and and, uh, and took that picture. A few other pictures there of our team, the top right, our local Gambia team. We have an office in the Gambia. Um, the middle picture there, the helicopter with the uh, government officials and myself going offshore to pay a visit. Um, uh, yeah, very, very good uh, achievement. I'm very proud of all that. So just going on into uh, into Gambia. So, um, so just to tell you how I feel and how we feel about the Gambia. I mean, it's two it comes down to two things. You know, basically we like the rocks, we like the geology. We're very, even though we had, we haven't found oil, but we understand the petroleum system so much more now, and we're still inspired and uh, motivated to continue to explore. Very much like the, the rocks and geology. Second thing is we like the country. We like the country. Uh, very good and enabling um, regulatory framework. We've got good relationships with the government and all the regulators, which you need to be when you're operating and done all the things we have done. Very good working relationship with the community and with the with the joint venture. And I guess now that we've, uh, we've done what we've done over the last 18 months, we're very proud to have a track record now as operator and uh, as a company that completes and undertakes its obligations and our promises to the country. Um, before I go, I pass on to the next speaker who will talk to you more about the geology. I just want to mention a little bit about our community programs. So country, uh, company like FAO, when you come into countries like the Gambia, we always like to give a little bit back and do the right thing and do some things in the community. And this um, this is a good thing. It helps our presence and local awareness in the country, but also helps our understanding by engaging local communities. Uh, helps with our general understanding, acceptance, uh, social license in the country. So the types of things we focus on are, of course, health and education and uh, and the environment. And um, and this year, I'm pleased to say that we finished off the SOMO, uh, so, the, sorry, the, the, the SOMO, um, SOMO hospital uh, upgrade, maternity hospital upgrade, which is about two hours up country in the Gambia. Very pleased to have done that project and handed it over, and the people there will be forever uh, pleased to, to have that upgrade and, and servicing the local community. And of course, uh, the other thing that we're just about to embark on is uh, is a local school that we intend to we're planning to do a, a small upgrade in that school. And we will we've got ambitions to continue our, our community program as we go in, on in future years in the country. So with that, I'd like to hand over to the next speaker, uh, uh, Peter Nichols, who's the exploration manager for FAR, and can give you a lot more information about the subsurface story. Thanks. Thanks, Ralph. Um, yeah. So a little bit about Samo. Um, uh, it was, as Ralph said, the, the well was very well drilled and drilled under budget. And the thing that Ralph mentioned too was that it was really well evaluated. We, because it was such a, a nice well, we got a lot of data out of it in terms of an engineering sense. We were able to get a lot of data out of it. So we got a lot of understanding of of what happened at, at Samo and the geology and the um, we're able to use utilize all that information to be able to um, move forward. It's it's one thing to drill a dry well, but it's a much more important thing to understand why it's dry and how that impl the implications for future prospectivity. So a step back to um, pre-drill, um, we considered that the 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 well was potentially connected to SNE. So that was a very positive thing. It could have been part of a larger field. Um, the other element of it was we were stepping um, closer to, in the Albion, the, 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 source, the uh, reservoir rocks at this age, it's, um, there was a major delta in the uh, Gambia area. So we're moving into the delta, we potentially had improved reservoirs. So there's a lot of positives going for us on Samo, which is why we were so enthusiastic about it. So what happened post-well? Um, two things really. We've got a lot of data and we can really distill it down now to two things that happened that were different from um, pre-drill. Uh, the first was that we came in structurally a bit lower. So we've still got a structure, we've still got it. it just that on its own did not uh, mean that the prospect wasn't valid, but it did separate it from SNE. So 
instead of being maybe one great big field, we, we have two structures. So a culmination, the SNE, that as Kath said, five billion barrels in it, a separate culmination, um, which as it turned out did not have hydrocarbons in it, but could have been quite large. So what was the second thing that potentially went, or that we've identified that went wrong? And it is that, yes, we, we as predicted, we were moving into the, the main part of the delta, so the reservoirs were were improved, but the downside to that is is that the sealing units, the shales between the reservoirs, were less well developed. So we had a seal breach. So to create a, um, a an, or to generate an oil field, you need the, both the reservoirs and the sealing units. So we had the reservoirs, but we didn't have the seal. But one of the things about the well, so that that had breached. So the one of the things about the well was we were able to evaluate it very well, so we were able to get indications all through the reservoir section and, and particular intervals that indicated oil had actually been through this reservoir. There's, there's oil in the system, it just was not able to be trapped. So that was a positive because that then immediately leads on to our next prospect, so where can we find prospects where that oil has been in the system or where it's been trapped? And so. Although we're very disappointed that Samo was a dry well, it's not like uh, it writes off the area. As um, Rolf said, that the, we really like the geology, you like to be where the oil is, and, and the, uh, the aim of our work as geologists is to find out where those traps are formed. And so that was our, and that leads on to the, the next thing. So this little cross section just shows, illustrates to some extent, I think, um, if I can, I don't know whether I can get my mouse on there. Yes, yeah, so this is a Samo well here, um, and uh, this is kind of schematic of where the reservoirs are that we were looking at, and this grey thing is kind of the seal. It gets very thin at Samo um, because we're developing, we're in the, uh, in the delta, so we're developing the reservoirs instead of the seals. So, it, but we got shows there, and it indicates the oil has gone up here. We've got Jammer, which does have good seals all through it. It's a, it's a little bit further away from the top of the delta. And we've got prospects between Jammer and Samo um, that all have well-developed reservoirs. We, we can see them in Jammer and well-developed seals. So what we've seen is, OK, the oil's gone through Samo, but where has it gone to? And that's the, the focus of our work at the moment. And as you can see on the, the map here, we've got a whole series of and we just call them blobs, but we've mapped these structures, potential um, prospects, and we're still working them up. So this is work in progress. So what I'm showing you is just kind of a snapshot in time and we're working it through. But we've got a lot of prospects. We've got more prospects now than we had uh, when we first came into the acreage because we've got a greater understanding of the geology so we can identify more, more prospects. So it's actually... Um, it, we're, we've actually got a, a greater um, prospectivity in one sense than we had when we started. Um, and we're working through these through, as Kath said, we're looking to drill in 2020. So we've still got another year to work these up, or six to nine months, because we need a little bit of lead time going into the drilling. And um, we're continuing to work these. But I'll just talk to a couple of them that we've, uh, we've worked, we've firmed up to some extent. So in the north here, we've got Solu and Bambo. We've um, had those on the books for a while. You will have seen those. And we've got Marlow down to the south here, but there's a whole lot of others as well. So Solu and Bambo, um, I'll just talk to a little bit. The prospects um, indicated the volumes here. Um, they're still being worked, so this might, there might be re future revisions, but this is uh, the state of play at the moment. And you can see that Solu um, could well be an extension of SNE. and and a matter of fact, it's very much mapped as an extension of SNE into the Gambia. And that is uh, Woodside and the other operators, uh, the other um, joint venture partners in SNE, all see that um, SNE does extend into the Gambia. So that's not a uh, you know not a contentious issue. It's it's um, the way it's seen as and mapped as just extending into our block. So we are going through evaluating well what volume have we potentially got in our block and, it, and is it um, constituted well. But the interesting thing about that is this Bambo prospect that overlies it, where it, if you follow the migration paths is where the oil from Samo would, would likely end up, um, is, is overlying that feature. And that is a, quite a large prospect as you see there, it's, uh, it's potentially three, 300 million barrels or more. So um, we've got lots to look forward to and that's the work that we're um, 
undergoing at the moment, the ge geotechnical team, and uh, so we're, we're working towards firming these up and within this next six to 12 months we'll have a, a much longer prospect list there with some um, recommendations for drilling uh, into 2020. So I'll hand back to Kath now to talk about some of the other acreage we have. Thanks, Pete. I think Pete sort of downplays himself and the role he's played and the team's played in the Gambia. Um, we've had numerous visits from Petronas over the last few months and they're really thrilled with the work that our team's doing and they are very supportive of everything we put forward, including um, the potential to drill a well early in 2020, which is uh, great news for all of us, really, to follow that oil up dip and uh, see if we can find the accumulation. So you'll be hearing a lot more from us in the second half of the year about where perhaps we'll be drilling. As we know, we need to, um, there's normally a sort of nine to 12 month lead time if we want to drill a well. We know that from our experiences at, at SUMO. So mid-year or Q3, we'll be starting to order long lead items and get organised for a well if the plan is to drill early next year. Um, we've got a licence hurdle to get through in the meantime, which means we need to enter the next phase of the licence in the Gambia, and that's going to happen mid-year. And with that, we will submit our work program to the government and it will include a well at some stage in the next two years. So lots of excitement coming up in the Gambia. And as Pete said, we hope that we understand much more now where that oil has migrated to and, and reduce the, the risk of uh, finding oil, which is great. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Guinea-Bissau. It's been the sort of um, poor relation to Senegal and Gambia over the last few years, partly because of the politics, but partly because of the immaturity of the prospects that we've got there. And we've got um, just over 21% interest in three blocks off Guinea-Bissau. Uh, these blocks, as I showed you in the first map, extend south of the Gambia and we can follow the shelf edge trend that we have the SNE field in around through to Guinea-Bissau uh, and through our acreage in, in fact. Um, back in the, I think, mid-90s, um, was it Premier made a discovery in uh, Guinea-Bissau called Sinapa. It's a small oil field up on the shelf. Um, it's quite heavyish oil. It's not a huge oil field, but there's indications of a working petroleum system there. So we kind of like these blocks, but at the moment, but up on the shelf, we struggled to find prospects that were big enough for us to drill and warrant the expenditure. Post the SNE discovery, our focus has been shifted to the deeper water and up, off to the shelf edge and following that trend around. And it's likely we'll be drilling the prospect here that you can see out to the west called Atom. It's Atom and Anchova complex. And Svenska, our partners in this project, are in the process of farming down to a pretty big operator. And once that farm down's completed, we'll be uh, announcing the drilling of a well in Q1 next year. Preparations have already started, long lead items have been bought and we'll be moving forward with uh, finalising rig arrangements and, and well locations over the coming months. So you'll see some progress there. Atom Prospect has the opportunity to be quite big. Geology gets a little different as we head further south and so our chance of success is pretty conservative. I think it's down in the low teens for that well. Um, so we're back into frontier exploration really, but um, it's quite an exciting one given the size of the structure. Last year we also um, had some modifications to the licence agreed. Uh, the licence was pretty immature in Guinea-Bissau. It's a, very much a developing country with a poor petroleum code. So we had some upgrades to the licence that really just better described what happens in the event of making a discovery and how we move forward. And at the same time, uh, the state oil company Petrogen decided that they didn't want to have a participation in the project. So we picked up another 5% working interest in the project, which is great for us. So it's just over 21% now. We are looking to potentially farm that well down and get carried through the drilling of that well. So that's a process that uh, is underway now. Kenya, this is a project that's been around for quite some time. Personally, I really like it, but um, the politics and, and the 
all the above ground issues in Kenya are really tricky for us. We have 60% of a block called L6, which is a transition zone block, meaning it's partly onshore and partly offshore. We've had issues with getting seismic data acquired onshore because of um, rebels coming across the border from Somalia and we haven't been able to access the ground. The government's been fairly accommodating there in terms of suspending our licence and our work permit, uh, our, our uh, work commitments in Kenya and we're just reinvigorating our discussions with them now to see whether there's something that we can do there and we're waiting for ministerial approval there. When in the hype of all of the Kenyan exploration that was taking place maybe four or five years ago, all of these offshore blocks were licensed and now we're the only operator that exists offshore. All of those blocks are vacant. So it tells you a little bit about politics in Kenya and the fact that most of the big operators moved out, particularly once the oil price tailed off um, five years ago. Uh, that we still believe there's good opportunity there. There are a couple of wells drilled that found some hydrocarbons and we happen to be in a really nice geological province there that we, we think should work for us. But it's all the above ground issues we're dealing with uh, in Kenya at the moment, not the below ground issues. I always say that the biggest risk in our business is always the chance of finding oil, but sometimes we just get stumped by the politics and what's going on above the ground. In Australia, we have an exploration permit on the northwest shelf. We've been pretty quiet about this over the last couple of years. We've been trying to complete our 3D seismic survey over the block. We really like it because um, the block sits over a shoal or a reef, and the reef is there because we believe there are oil seeps, and that's generating the bugs that um, eat up all of the all the nutrients and build the reef. So. Um, it's a, a fair indication that there could be some oil and gas in the block, but due to environmental restrictions, we haven't been able to complete the seismic for a couple of years. But the good news is um, the boat went in the water and we've now finished our 3D seismic survey. The government's about to give us an extension to our commitments of about 18 months uh, on the clock. So we will have our seismic data in-house late Q3 and we'll be looking to farm that down. We've got 100% of that block. Um, I think one thing that's gone for us in the interim eh, is, of course, that the oil price has Im improved over the last couple of years. But secondly, um, there's been a lot of activity on the northwest shelf in the last year, and particularly with Carnarvon's discoveries further north from us. And that's the reason why we could get a boat in the water and get a bit of activity happening in the area. So we're pretty hopeful if we get some good structures there. Uh, and can map them that we'll be able to bring in a partner for drilling in the future. We've got some nice looking prospects there. <coughs> so we at FAR pride ourselves on our good governance and our sustainability. You would have seen that we've upgraded our climate change policy on our website recently. We put a lot of effort into making sure that our governance statements are up to date and accurate. And from a sustainability point of view, we <coughs> We love to put the effort into the communities in which we work and Rolf hinted at some of the community programs that we work with. We have lots of initiatives going on in Senegal as well and with our joint venture partners in Guinea-Bissau. We're really proud of them and the achievements that we've had there over the last few years. It's enabled FAR to stay front of mind with the government officials in all the countries in which we operate. So um, we do it for all the right reasons in terms of of bringing opportunities and, and doing our bit to help raise the standard of living in the countries in which we operate. But it's also good for FAR and our reputation in country. And as Rolf said, helps us to keep in touch with the local people and the issues. When you consider that a country like Senegal has 14 million people, a country like Gambia has under 2 million people, any large oil discoveries are going to be really significant for the people of the country. So we're really proud of the work that we do with communities there. So looking forward into this year and early 2022, these are the big challenges and the tasks that FAR will be uh, working on over the coming months. Maturing the SNE project clearly for development and getting to FID and financing it is the biggest thing that we've got ahead of us in the coming months. And we look forward to bringing lots of news to you about how our joint ventures is progressing there. Uh, as I said, we'll be drilling uh, exploration well in Guinea-Bissau in early next year 
and if everything lines up nicely for us we might be able to get a multi-well uh, option on a rig and drill in Gambia at the same time. We know that Seanook is planning a couple of wells in the neighbourhood and BP as well so we've already started talking to them about rig sharing contracts to get a chain of, of wells going. Interestingly rig rates haven't really increased that much. We're starting to see perhaps in a couple of years an uptick in deep water rig rates but they're staying fairly constant at the moment so the, the sort of low price rig that we enjoyed last year that was an, an A-class rig uh, we should be able to get a similar rig at similar rates leading into 2022, which is good for us. We've got some bids out at the moment in and around the area uh, for some more acreage to build on our portfolio and hopefully we'll get some news on those in the coming months as well. And of course, you know, the big A, the arbitration in Senegal that we've been waiting for for the best part of two and a half years is um, is finally getting heard uh, in front of the tribunal in Paris in July. So um, we look forward to eventually bringing you some results from that. So uh, stay tuned on that one. So that concludes my presentation and I look forward to having a chat with you all and please introduce yourself to our management team. Um, our office of course is just around the corner on Collins Street and we welcome our shareholders any time to come and have a cup of tea with us or give us a call if you've got any issues that you'd like to discuss. Uh, thank you very much um, from the team at FAR uh, for your support and um, thank you and look forward to a terrific 2019.